First of all, I just want to share my condolences to all South Africans about the loss of Nelson Mandela, um, actually the world. <laughs> um, it's just kind of amazing to think that we've been so privileged to live on the same planet as that person, even for a short while. But anyway, my condolences. I also want to thank Open Air and the Global Congress for inviting me to be part of this really great meeting. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is cat, I call it Cat and Mouse, it's a project I'm working on, and it's about form shifting in the battle over intellectual property and enforcement. Um, first, my first premise is that intellectual property policy is a public policy. It's not an end in itself. And sometimes people talk about it as if it is an end in itself and a good in and of itself, but it's really a public policy. And we've had over time shifting conceptions of what ownership is, uh, what is authorship, and what is invention. And um, Historically, these have changed, and they're definitely not static, as anyone who follows these issues knows. Um, what intellectual property protection provides is a temporary monopoly privilege. Um, it's temporary. It's supposed to incentivize creation and invention. Um, but intellectual property is public policy. When you think of it that way, you have to be sensitive to different stages of development. And if you look at the US experience, for example, historically, we, we had very lax copyright laws for foreigners because we wanted to encourage a literate public. Uh, Charles Dickens was not happy about that, but we were selling his books for about two pennies a book. Um, but at that stage, we had a public policy of wanting to have a literate public. And there are a lot of examples of this. Our land-grant universities in the United States were founded to give seeds away to farmers so that they would start to develop the land and we could feed our growing population. Now you think about patents on seeds, it's a pretty different landscape. But historically, our development was very much, uh, intellectual property was very much devoted to public policies. And sometimes it took a back seat or it was uh, molded in a way to promote public policy goals. Now, um, one thing I want to talk about is the politics. I'm not a lawyer, I'm a political scientist, I should make that clear. Um, and I'm not with the GW Law School, I'm in the political science department. Um, but I want to talk about the politics, because that's what I'm really interested in, is the international politics of intellectual property protection. And um, what we learned from the theory of collective action in political science is that uh, the politics of intellectual property, we can look at domestic politics in the United States, and the theory of collective action tells us that small groups can mobilize to protect their interests. And the conditions under which they do so, where these small groups mobilize to pr protect their interests, are when their interests are directly threatened and the benefits are highly concentrated. This helps to explain why it's difficult to mobilize consumers, for example. Um, and so the politics of intellectual property in the 1970s and 1980s is a perfect example of collective action and practice. Um, these were the actors behind the push for greater, stronger intellectual property protection. It was studios, movie studios like Disney. Uh, it was the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers Association. And there's Bill Gates, but it was um, Microsoft and software producers. They felt that foreign intellectual property protection of their goods was weak. They had a very direct interest. They felt that their profits were threatened by lax protection, so they mobilized. They were very effective, and they were able to push US foreign pol economic policy in the direction of getting other countries to in, uh, improve the protection of intellectual property. Um, I like to think about this whole process as a cat and mouse game. And one of my favorite cartoons growing up was Tom and Jerry. I had a clip, but the internet kept saying buffering, so I'm not going to show it to you. But Tom and Jerry is a really great cartoon. And the cat and the mouse are always chasing each other around. And it's like Peter Drehaus says, the negotiations are never really over. Tom and Jerry never stop chasing each other around. And that is the poli international politics of intellectual property. So who's the cat? And I'm oversimplifying cat and mouse, but it's such a complicated landscape. I think these, these two cartoon characters are a pretty good guide through this morass. So the cat, who is he? The cat is uh, industry associations multinational enterprises, USTR, uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation in Development Countries, and uh, WIPO, especially when it comes to technical assistance. Uh, what does the cat want? The cat wants to ration IP. 
make it scarce, keep it scarce. Um, and what are the characteristics of the cat? Sorry, this black's not showing up too well for you, but um, characteristics of the cat, large resources, uh, strong, um, just like Tom. Okay, who's the mouse? The mouse is Jerry. Uh, who's Jerry? Jerry is developing countries, NGOs, many of whom are here today and you've heard from and will be hearing more from. Some firms are like Jerry, generics, some computer equipment manufacturers, and lately IT um, firms that are concerned about patent trolls, for example. So that's the mouse. Um, and what does the mouse want? The mouse wants access to intellectual property. And what are the characteristics of the mouse? It tends to be weaker, smaller, fewer resources. So we're going to see what Tom and Jerry have been up to these past years. Um, and one of the things Tom and Jerry have been up to is horizontal forum shifting. Horizontal forum shifting occurs across multilateral institutions. And one of the interesting things is we've seen a real proliferation of forums in which intellectual property is discussed. It's in almost every inter international organization now that you can imagine, versus back in the day when WIPO was the only game in town. So we've seen a proliferation of forums, which has led to more opportunities for forum shifting. So the first forum shift was the one of Tom, the cat who wasn't really happy with WIPO, back in the day in the mid-1980s when the Paris Convention negotiations were going on because India and Brazil, they were being a little bit vexing from the United States point of view. So uh, they felt that they might get a better deal if they could link intellectual property protection to the trade system. So Tom went from WIPO over to the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, 1986, for the Uruguay round of trade negotiations, bringing intellectual property protection into the trade regime. And this resulted in the Agreement on Trade-Related Intellectual Property Protection, 1994, that you're all familiar with, and the establishment of the World Trade Organization. This is binding, it's enforceable, unlike any agreements that existed before. So this is hard law, as lawyers would refer to it. However, Jerry was busy as well, and especially in, in connection with the HIV-AIDS crisis, um, started to have discussions at the World Health Assembly in the late 1990s about access to essential medicines. And some of the key players behind that are here. They're going to be here. Um, and uh, it's a fascinating story. But anyway, they were busy in another forum that they felt might be more congenial because health was the priority of the WHO. So in the World Health Assembly of 1999, they were able to get some issues around intellectual property into a declaration in the World Health Assembly and they brought it over to the World Trade Organization. So they too engaged in horizontal form shifting. And this resulted in the Doha Declaration on Trips and Public Health in 2001. It also led to the Paragraph 6 Amendments coming out of, you know, that allowed people that couldn't manufacture generic drugs to import them under compulsory license. So something that was cooked up in the forum that was the World Health Organization was brought into the trade regime this way. Um, however, Tom was really not satisfied with TRIPS. Tom wanted higher and higher standards of intellectual property protection and all of a sudden people were paying attention to intellectual property because of the HIV AIDS pandemic. So suddenly the WTO wasn't the most congenial place to get what they wanted. So they went trotting over to their old buddies, WIPO, who were a little nervous because they, I mean, they wanted a bigger institutional role because they felt a little bit dissed when the US had taken it over into the trade regime. So they were eager, um, so Tom felt, and said, let's work on a substantive patent law harmonization treaty in 2001 to again raise standards that they couldn't get in TRIPS and they definitely weren't going to be able to get in WTO now that people are really paying attention to this issue. So uh, Tom comes over and, and promotes, you know, substantive patent law harmonization treaty. Meanwhile, Jerry, no, I don't think so. Instead, Jerry's saying, I want a development agenda. We're not going to talk about higher standards until we talk about what intellectual property means for development and developing issues. So WIPO proposed proposed uh, development, or the proposal came through in uh, 2004, and WIPO adopted it in 2007. This led to another kind of forum shifting. This was a move to vertical forum shifting. Now, vertical forum shifting occurs when you have interests that you know 
other people don't share, and you want to be able to achieve your goal. So vertical form shifting is different. And once the WIPO development agenda was adopted, Tom got busy elsewhere and shifted to plurilateral negotiations. And here we see the negotiations on ACTA, anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, and trans-Pacific partnership negotiations, and now TTIP also with the Europeans. So multilateral shifting to plurilateral because Tom knew that it couldn't get, he couldn't get what he wanted in these multilateral venues. So vertical form shifting, and here's just a bigger picture with this black ink you can't read. But one example um, is the WIPO development agenda at the multilateral level, going down to ACTA and TPP and TTIP at the plurilateral level. And then the regional level would be uh, North American Free Trade Agreement, Central American Free Trade Agreement. The bilateral level, there's many, many bilateral intellectual property agreements. And then finally, the unilateral level, and this these examples I would point out would be the United States Trade Representative's <laughs> use of Section 301 of the Trade Act to uh, complain about foreign intellectual property protection, and then the Stop, Op Stop Online Piracy Act and prevent, uh, or protect, not prevent intellectual property, protect intellectual property act. So SOPA and PIPA. Um, and these were unilateral efforts to um, increase protection of rights holders. Um, Anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, a lot of people were complaining about it, uh, saying that it would interfere with privacy, um, and there was a lot of complaints that it was asking for too much in terms of copyright. What it was really doing was targeting European foreign websites. It was targeting foreign websites um, and, oh, I'm sorry, SOPA PIPA. This acronyms just drive me crazy, but in D.C., you live with acronyms. That's how we talk in my town. At any rate, so anti-counterfeiting trade agreement was fairly sweeping, fairly broad. There were some leaked chapters that led to them scaling back what it was, but still it caused a lot of concern about what it meant for uh, consumers. Um, now, Stop Online Piracy Act and Protect Intellectual Property Act in the United States was targeted at the foreign websites. The idea was we're going to block... Um, Americans from accessing those websites that host in copyright infringing content, and we're going to prevent services like PayPal from processing payments to these um, uh, rogue web websites. So SOPA people was a really interesting shift in the politics, and um, U.S. domestic politics, business as usual, had always been, you can see these guys, you know, they own Congress, little crony capitalism picture there. They had always gotten what they wanted. They were used to it. They would go to USTR and say, well, our intellectual property would be pirate. We're losing all this money. And they would always get a response from the government. Every time they got a response from the government, they got exactly what they wanted. Um, there was a revolving door. You know, you work at USTR for a few years, you can get a really great job for pharma or MPAA. You're in Congress. Christopher Dodd, former Senate senator is Chief Executive Officer of the Motion Picture Association of America. So they just accept, expected SOAP and PIPA to sail right through because that's what every time, every time for years now, in, from the 70s, they got everything they wanted. And, um, but this time was different. And um, people were paying attention, people like Aaron, the late uh, Aaron Schwartz, um, a lot of the technology companies, social media, social platforms, and they got wind of this and said, we have to stop this. We have to. And they used ICT, as we've been talking about in this meeting, and social media to mobilize. And in this instance, they were able to, um, they said, we're going to go dark. These sites are going to go dark. And it was a very palpable way to let people know what was at stake in these agreements. If these went, went forward, this was what it would mean for you. And so... Um, one day, people woke up and they got on their browsers, and I'm sure all my students wanted Wikipedia because they were writing papers or something. They freaked out because the page said, imagine a world without free knowledge. That's what was at stake. But it really caught people's attention um, in a way that just yapping about it just didn't do. So it was a very powerful tool. And it led to um, an anonymous did some tricksterish things against Hollywood executives and stuff like that. But at any rate, it managed to, um, this movement managed to get some of the Congress members involved, certainly some that had backgrounds in IT, 
Senator Ron Wyden, who had written some internet service provider safe harbor legislation. And so it was politicians as well as this transnational social movement around uh, protecting our rights on the internet that were able to shut this law down, much to the complete shock of the rights holders. They did not see this one coming. Um, so SOAP and PEOPLE were dead in Congress, and the death of SOAP and PEOPLE in the United States got the Europeans kind of excited, like, wow, look what happened there, and it got them to motivate and move against ACTA. There had been a lot of opposition, but they didn't hit much traction, and then it sparked these protests within just about a month after SOAP and PEOPLE died, and this is just the cities where all these protests were occurring um, in February 2012. Polish Parliament, they all came with their anonymous mask. The anonymous mask is an image of Guy Fox that's owned by Time Warner, and that's why they <laughs> like to wear it. <laughs> um, so anyway, there, there's Guy Fox mask there, owned by Time Warner. Um, and now we've come to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is all over the news right now. Half of you have been on your laptops this entire meeting, keeping up with you know the latest <laughs> things on the IP chapters that were leaked by WikiLeaks. Um, and I'm not blaming you, it's very important agreement and very, um, very, very uh, high standards of IP, like nothing we've seen before. So Trans-Pacific Partnership, again, another vertical forum shift. Um, so there's a question whether the ACTA that got killed in Europe, is this contagious to the PPP? There's a lot of similar kind of protests going on around it. Um, however, TPP is really different. Um, in that it's an actual trade negotiation. It's not just an IP negotiation. So there's opportunities for trade-off, and I think the security concerns are probably gonna trump anything. The US does have a lot of leverage here. Um, and China didn't do IP, uh, non-IP maximalists any favors when it started goofing around in the airspace last week, and then Dudley Durek came to the rescue. Um, U.S. So um, U.S. has a lot of leverage there because Asian countries are nervous about China for insecurity terms. So there's a lot more trade-offs available in this agreement. Um, so there's protests against TPP, but what it sounds like so far is the U.S. is probably going to get most of what it wants in terms of intellectual property. Now I want to bring it to the open air scenarios before I um, get get off get the hook. Um, what the Air, open air scenarios that we talked about this week were wireless engagement was one, another was informals, the new normal, and finally, sincerely, Africa. And I think the important thing to keep in mind <laughs> is that intellectual property, again, it's a public policy. It's one piece, and you have to take a historical perspective. Correlation is not causation. The U.S. can come and say, look at how high our standards are. Look at how high our standard of living is in our GDP. Doesn't that look nice? Don't you want those things? Yeah, take these high standards and you'll get this. But in fact, if you look historically, we have high standards now, but we didn't always have high standards, nor did Korea, which came up in an earlier question uh, this morning. So the historical perspective is very important. Um, and in terms of uh, the open air scenarios, who are you? Who are you today? Are you like the United States today? Is that a really good model for you? Um, which of the three scenarios? I would argue that all three scenarios coexist right now. And are we going to see continued conflict between the cats and the mice, which is what we've been seeing? Or will we see peaceful coexistence between intellectual property, uh, appropriate intellectual property policies across these three scenarios, which differ? Will we see creative engagement between cats and mice and these different kinds of scenarios or strategic withdrawal, as Peter Drehaus had mentioned, as a possible option? Um, so I just want to throw those things out for later when we get in our smaller groups just to get you thinking about different things going forward. And I want to thank you.